Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the basic gist of CCM is the following. We, we know from earlier about this construct of state space. The idea is, look, at any one time, the model is in a certain state. And if we were to draw out sort of the state of the model on a diagram, you know, where, let, let's suppose we're dealing with a system dynamics model for, for, for ease. If we put S on one axis, E on another axis, I on another axis, and maybe we'll make it an SIR model for ease of thinking about it. Here's SIR. We could mod at any one time, this model is going to have a certain value for S, a certain value for I, a certain value for R. So we could plot it as a point in three space, in three dimensional space. Hmm? Its value, the, the coordinate of this point along this axis would be the value it has for S. The coordinate, coordinate along this axis would be the value it has for Y. Coordinate along this axis would be the value it has for R. You can imagine this, in, it's in three dimensional space, right? And over time, as that system evolves, say S goes up as, or S goes down as people are infected, and um, eventually R goes up, you know, it might move around. Your S is becoming smaller, R is becoming larger. It'll move around in state space, okay? That's, that's a, a view of what state space means. The location in state space completely describes the state of the system, okay? Um, and uh, time is implicit in this. So here's an SI, SIT model, T, uh, SITS, because you have this recovery, and it can go around in a spiral. This is a depiction of its state space, okay? Um, how it evolves over time. Now it turns out that the state space is often, the occupied state space is often much smaller than the nominal state space. This is three dimensions, but actually if you look at it from the right angle, you'll find it's two dimensional because there's a conservation here. S plus I plus this TI1, these have to sum to the same value. <laughs> so if you only know two, it only has two degrees of freedom. And so this is, nominally it's a 3D state space, but it only occupies two dimensions of it. Okay. Um, now, um, there's all theory of this, and, and when you have nonlinear models, they can have different basins of attraction. You can have, um, uh, you can have the system go one way if it's on one side, if it's on another side, it can go another way. So depending where, where you start, for example, or parameter values, an infection could die out and everyone could become susceptible again, or it could take off, there could be few susceptibles and lots of infectives. This is state space, okay? And it's state space because we have one stock here and one stock there, okay? And at any one time, the model state is, some, is a point here and it evolves. So that's state space. And um, uh, when we have coupled nonlinear systems, um, the evolution of one state variables depends on others, right? Um, and uh, we saw it you know, earlier with this, uh, right? How many people are getting infected from susceptibles? In other words, is susceptibles dropping quickly, uh, for example, will depend on how many infectives there are. If there ain't no infectives, susceptibles is not going to be dropping quickly because no one's going to get infected, right? There's, there's nobody who's going to get infected without infectives. And likewise, if there's no susceptibles, I will not be rising because there can't be any new infections because there's nobody to get infected. S is zero. And so when you have a model like this, there's a lot of coupling between its different points. What's going on over an I determines the value of S and vice versa. There, there's coupling. And in general, with these nonlinear models, um, their, uh, their evolution depends on the broader state of the system, okay? We saw this with, with, hair, with lynxes and hares, right? Um, and these are the governing equations behind a, one of the most common so-called Latka-Volterra Latka equations, which are for predator and prey. And what you can do, I didn't show this to you earlier, I didn't want to scare you, but if you have a system described like that, the change in number of hairs depends on a birth rate for hairs and a death rate for hair, which is also impacted by lynxes. And the birth rate for lynxes depends on, on some, um, uh, some, some constant, it's a 
function related to the number of hairs that they catch. So there's an X here and then some death rate. If you, if you have a system like this, you can show that the value of Y, you can see that it, it depends on X. Like the, the, um, if I know X and the rate of change of X, I can compute Y. And if I know Y, I can comp and the rate of change of Y, I can compute X. And I argued that it makes sense. I mean, that, that, that's not merely some weird coincidence, but it makes sense. You know, if I know that the number of hairs that prey are dropping rapidly, it almost certainly tells me there's a lot of hair lynxes around compared to that. It, it, it makes sense that one thing tells me about the other because they're so coupled, right? And the same thing with, you know, something like uh, mosquitoes and West Nile and so on. Um, if I know the number of infected people are dropping rapidly, probably the mosquito population and or prevalence is low. You know, it tells me about a different part of the system, right? Um, uh, so the same is true here, though, not just about models like this. The same is true for systems out there in the world, okay? And this is formalized in Taken's Embedding Theorem. Okay, Taken's Embedding Theorem says, look, under a broad set of conditions, if we have a coupled system, we can reconstruct the underlying state space that's driving that system. Regardless of whether we model it or not, we can reconstruct it using just a single time series from that system. And this has been proven for broad classes of systems. And so um, uh, it's, it's very well established. But given, uh, uh, so how do we do it? Well. We have a time series, call it Y, and we engage in what's called delay embedding. So for each time point Y, in, in Y, let's say Y sub T, we create a vector. And it's a vector in, say, three-dimensional space. And, and basically, we create a vector, and we plot out that value in that three-dimensional space. And we do it for, say, T equals zero, and T equals one here. T equals you know, 10, and T equals 11, and T equals 12. And you'll notice that each vector is defined by, it's called delay embedding, because the elements of the vector, the thing we're going to plot in three-dimensional space, sort of three elements, are the, the value of Y at the current point, let's say Y of 10, the value, let's suppose tau is 1, the value of Y at 10 minus 1, y of 9, and the value of, of y at 10 minus 2, or 8. And so I will plot, in this reconstructed state space, I will plot y, a, a, a data point whose coordinates are given by y of 10, y of 9, and y of 8. Okay? And then I'll do that for y of 11 as well. I'll have y of 11, and y of 10, and y of 9. And I'll do this for each of these data points. Okay? And that's exactly what I did for you. I don't know if you remember it, but it's exactly what I did for you in that model of hairs and links. Do you remember that? I plotted hairs versus hairs at time t minus 1. That's all that was. Or if you want to download, I, I've uh, loaded extra models like this online. If you want to go download in your participant resources and example models, there's something called, there's the predator prey one, but there's also a Lorenz attractor, and I'll, I'll just run set. Here's our Lorenz attractor, and I'm going to do, here we go, it's a, it's a simulation, and I will run this, and it will produce for me, this is based on a model of atmospheric convection originally, I believe. So here I am running it, um, it has three stocks, X, Y, Z, and this is a plot of X versus Y, Y versus Z, and, and and uh, X versus Z. By the way, where you really want to view this is Oculus. Um, uh, and then this is what is created by plotting X versus previous of X. And this is what is, is, is plotted by measured X. Uh, I don't know, OK, this is like measuring with some error, I think. Um, uh, in any case, the point is, this is an embedded reconstruction of that. You notice that it, it's just kind of a stretch version of that, same thing from above. So the idea here is that this is true for a broad class of systems, okay? That you can reconstruct them through delay embedding. And so it seems like a weird factoid, but it can be shown mathematically 
that if you do this delay embedding, you, you put in place this mechanism, here it is over here, um, where each point in the time series you create these vectors and you stick them into state space, what you get out is something that, that is just um, a picture of the state space stretched in the appropriate way, okay? I'm glossing over some things involving dimensionality, but that's basically it. Okay, um, so uh, here we go, and this is what the sort of reconstructed state spaces look like of this original value. Um, okay, um, so here's uh, delay embedding, and it turns out you want to choose tau. Um, have larger if you're sampling very frequently in the time series compared to dynamics. You could, you could have it be smaller if you're not um, sampling very frequently. Here's, con here's convergent cross-mapping. The idea behind convergent cross-mapping is look. Uh, it's a brilliant idea that came out of Sugihara's lab and has been published in the pages of Science as well as several other journals. Ladies and gentlemen, you want to know if variable A and variable B are causally connected. All you have is observational data. It's going to sound like heresy for some of you, mm -hmm. but it's well established scientifically. I have variable A and I have variable B. Or let's call it X and Y. I want to know is not only are X and Y causally linked, I want to know is Y driving X? Is Y causing change in X? Recognizing there's lots of other reasons like X and Y might be correlated without it being causal, but no, I, I, I don't want, I want, I don't want some to be told it's causal if it's only correlational. I want to know is Y causing X to change? That's what I want to know. And this method provides a way of establishing that. And it is based on Taken's embedding theorem. And let me give you the gist of it, which I wish someone had given me when I first started studying this stuff, okay? Um, the gist of it is this. When you perform state space reconstruction with, um, with uh, delay embedding. What you are recovering in this, this is called a, a shadow manifold, okay? It's, it's kind of a reconstructed state space, it's also called, okay? It's reconstructed in the sense that we, all we do is we take one variable from the system that we observe over time and we plot out through this delay embedding, generally more than two dimensions, but, but you get the idea. You plot out this thing and you get something that's just like the original state space. So it's reconstructed, but it's stretched and kind of twisted sometimes, okay, um, in a kind of regular way. The idea here is this state space that we are reconstructing, Let's, let's imagine we're reconstructing the state space for x in this way, using the values of x at t, x of t minus tau, x of t minus 2 tau, et cetera, just like we, we, we saw in our description of delay embedding, right? So suppose we're doing this for x alone, okay? Um, what I actually get out in the state space is the reconstruction of the state space that is driving x. Okay? It's not like it reconstructs the world, everything going on in the world. It's, it's reconstructing the state space driving X. Those elements of the world that are driving X. That's what's, it doesn't, you know, mysteriously see over, you know, over in Antarctica, this penguin is getting close to an egg or something like, sorry, it's late on Friday. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't know on Alpha Centauri there's a solar flare which is, you know, approaching, approaching a moon. Um, it doesn't know this at all. All it knows is about the things that affect it, right? So when you do this reconstructing, it reconstructs the state space of the factors governing X. Hmm? Makes sense. Things that govern X, that drive X, those are the things that it reconstructs. That's its state space. Now, critically, man, I wish someone had explained this to me. Critically, if you're, this is our reconstructed state space. Consider a given point in the state space. I have slides on this later, but, but let me go at lib here. So if I consider a point in this reconstructed state space, 
maybe here it's two dimensions, but I have some nice pretty pictures for three dimensions later that, that clue us into this. Consider a point in the state space and consider the nearby points. These nearby points are nearby in the sense of being nearby in state space, okay? And what that means is the state of the system driving X is similar for each of those points. Those points may be from radically different points in time. It's just X of T and X of T minus tau and X of T minus two tau for whatever different T's there were happened to yield a point and near here. Um, but what they share in common is that they're nearby in the state space, so the underlying system that's driving X was in a similar state for each of these points. But they can be from very different points in time. Okay, now, that is the key thing to know, that nearby here means the system driving X is in a nearby place, and moreover, to recognize that these nearby points are not nearby in time. They're, they can be from very different periods of time. Okay, so, so what? So what? That's kind of neat, but so what? Well, now we look at how information about another time series, suppose we're interested in knowing is Y driving X. We look at how closeness in state space here tells us anything about Y, okay? If Y is part of the system that's driving X, closeness in this state space will tell us a lot about Y because Y is part of the state of the system driving X. These points will all, despite being from very different points in time, despite being, now this, this is gonna sound strange, but these are from different values uh, associated with, so this is a point in the state space of X, but the value of X, this is some arbitrary point here, the value of X is different you know, along different dimensions here. The actual value, this might be, you know, X of T minus tau is 11, or, you know, 6, so the value of T minus 2 tau is, is 10, and the value of, of X of T is 0, or something. So there's different values of X. If Y is merely correlated with X, similarity in state space, like uh, that, that's not going to lead these points to have very similar values of Y, okay? And what's gonna happen is we're going to con consider, and this is all mapped out in these slides, in some care, because it took me a while to get, to cut, to, to grok this. But basically, as you fill in more points in the state space, as you fill in more points, as you fill in further the shadow manifold, it turns out that that is going to lead to a very big increase, particularly as it becomes from very sparse to, to less sparse to more dense, it's gonna lead to a big increase in your ability to predict why if why is if, if Y, if closeness in state space, now that we have more points close to our red point of interest, if we can predict the value of Y at the red point on the basis of, of, of points around it, as we get more points around it getting closer in state space, meaning in state to, to the red point, we're gonna be able to predict the value of Y better and better. And, that's, and it turns out that that is not the case for merely correlation where Y is merely correlated with X, who knows, because of some Z that we don't observe. Okay, so it turns out that closeness in state space here, looking at how that changes in our ability to predict the value of Y based on nearby points. So basically we, we figure out the value of Y for the nearest points, the nearest E plus one points where E is the dimensional of the space and we take the weighted average of those to estimate the value of Y at this red point, a point of focal interest. And we look at how well we can do this as, the, as we fill in more points here and as things get closer in state space. And it turns out that gives a really, often a very clear signature, is Y driving X. 
and we can distinguish it from a causal, uh, a causal from merely a correlational um, linkage because correlation does not lead to these properties of closeness in state space. And it leads to, um, in fact, uh, different values, like if, if y, if x along this axis is, is one value, the nearby y points along that point will be correlated with that value of x and so on along different dimensions. So what this leads to is criteria about the relationship between these. If you have a causal connection, there's certain components, and this is what you get out. When there's a causal connection between y and x, and you try to, under, you try to estimate y on the basis of the shadow manifold for x, this is what you get. You get what I like to call the beaming phase, ladies and gentlemen, of causality. Um, and, uh, son, you <laughs> probably heard me say that before and not in person though. Um, so this is the beaming face of causality. This shows the value, the ability to predict, the so-called skillfulness of predicting Y on the basis of nearbyness and X. As we add more points into the state space, we allow more points from time T, different times T, and we can predict Y better and better in this kind of growing way. Um, this is the beaming face of causality. This is without noise. You notice, what are, the, what are these kind of fringe things? Well, it turns out if we're considering different subsets of points that we add in, we may have different results here. But you see this kind of overall very clear picture that emerges. This is another case without noise. You get this immediate convergence in, in terms of amazing ability to predict why. Here's no causal connection nor probabilistic dependence between X and Y. Here X and Y have no correlation and they have no, they have no um, uh, causation between them. This is what you get. This is no skill in predicting. Closeness in X's, X's uh, reconstructed state space tells you nothing about Y. It doesn't, it doesn't let you predict Y um, at all. No, no, no probabilistic dependence, no causal dependence. Okay, no causal connection, but correlation. So here, maybe there's a Z driving X and Y, right? X, X is not driven by Y, but X is driven by something that also drives Y. And so X and Y will have this kind of spurious correlation that we might mistake if we glance at it for some sort of causal relationship, after all, x is high when y is high, x is low when y is low, and we might think, well, why maybe y is driving x. Okay, and I have this argument here, okay? Um, I wish I could leave this to my younger self. Um, this is what you get. So here, it goes to a non-zero value of skillfulness, but it does so in a way that is very different in terms of its patterns, including this kind of downward swooping from above, this sort of crest, the, the deceitful crest of correlation. Um, its honeyed crest tempts us to, 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 see, the, uh, to see it as, as causation, but with CCM, ladies and gentlemen, you know that. Um, and here, you don't see this kind of swoop up in general. You see this, uh, this pattern that's, that's typically uh, very different, okay? Um, and I examine a bunch of cases for lower L, less dense for higher L. Um, uh, okay, and it turns out to do this well, you, you, you need to do it for many realizations. Um, uh, you have to really scrutinize the trend for values less than 250, uh, L250, um, and, um, and I make comments on all these different things. I've done hundreds if not thousands of experiments, probably thousands of experiments now, personally. Um, I wish I had my students to do it, but they were busy. Well, I was busy too. You got it. Time to make the donuts. You gotta, you gotta learn. You gotta, you gotta cut through these things. I didn't have to hard cast them to do it, so I did it myself. Um, uh, okay, so this is non-causal with no noise, 
This is weakly or indirectly causal. This is, this is directly causal. Okay? Indirect causation is causation. You know, um, maybe Y doesn't directly determine X, but Y determines uh, a value of uh, A that determines X, or a value of a W that determines X, right? So, so um, indirect causation does leave its mark, but direct causation, this by the way is due to a bug which one of my students discovered in CCM and told them how to fix it. He fixed it himself in the code base, but told them how to fix it for, for the public version. Um, here you see stronger, uh, stronger causation. If anyone's interested in this, they have enormous amounts of, the, of these things. Um, here's with high noise, okay? This is more tricky. With high amounts of noise being added in stochastics for evolution of the underlying system, it gets more tricky. Your ability to recognize indirect causation is, is compromised somewhat, and, and you can still often get a pretty good read on a causal signature but it's not, it's not as nice and it often won't go to as high a, how, high a value. And it depends some on um, the embedding dimension. Um, this is statistical convergence only, yeah, and you don't want to do it with just means. Yes? Yeah, can you go back to the, question, uh, to the picture, please? Which picture? Uh, the co um, causation and correlation, the difference. Uh, this, like? Yeah, so basically those um, pictures, um, those three pictures, like three files of pictures, oh. like there's no like mm -hmm. deterministic um, way to tell which one is causation. Like, cause like for the for the mm -hmm. uh, middle one, it's mm -hmm. kind of sim similar to the third one, but only difference is that the yellow part in the middle middle is uh, is larger. Sorry, you mean but here? We're not trying to distinguish these two. We're trying to distinguish both of these from this. Mm -hmm. the, these are these are causal. Both of these are causal. So as long as like Correct. The yeah. And I'll give you a, I'll tell you a secret. Okay. Tell you a secret. It's probably it for me. Before the end, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to share with you the secret. So the secret is we do have uh, an automated algorithm to classify these that's pretty okay. good. <laughs> and it's based on deep learning. Yeah. Um, so we process the images and, and we fed it lots of examples like these. Um, so it was worth it doing thousands of Oh, it was worth it doing thousands. Just like, just like doing all those coughs for the cough recognition project was <laughs> worth it. Um, I volunteered hundreds of coughs um, <laughs> so they could recognize coughs. It was not a fun. It was not a fun thing. Um, uh, but the point is, um, we do have a deep learning classifier that can actually classify fairly well between these on the on the on, uh, as an overall and these ones here. These ones here, collectively, that the middle and right column are causal. I would want to know that this is causal. Because to me, if, if it's not really terribly material if Y causes X directly, if it causes it through one or more causal pathways. The question in my mind is, is it driving X? And, um, and so I have no, I, I, I would want to know this is causal. So these, are the um, these are the um, the ones that uh, I want to reject? These are the ones I want to accept. So can you show that high noise, yeah, yeah, high noise. So these get much more problematic. Weak causation, particularly particularly weak causation. This becomes more troubling to the signature and. It's not terribly surprising. If you have high amounts of noise, it's going to obscure your signal. These ones are still pretty recognizable. This one's getting a little bit iffy. But this is high noise. Like, like I've added a high bit of noise, a whole bunch of noise in addition to the governing processes. So in my view, it's a, you know, it's, it's a tough nut to crack, but it does pretty well. Yeah, I think the yeah. bottom two from the left, like left too far, like this yeah. one and the and this one yeah, yeah, looks like Exactly. Yeah. So what's the y-axis on that far uh, left? Are they all on the same axis? Uh, the y-axis is, yes. Uh, oh, are you saying like the actual um, scale? Yeah. I'd have to go look what the scale is. It's a good question. Um, I could go zoom in uh, at what the row is, but um, 
I, I don't happen to remember off the top of my the top of my um, I head. I imagine there's a way of comparing the distribution of, of each of those to, to, to calculate some obviously. Right. Um, so this is zero, this is point two up yeah, here. So they're much lower, right? Um, yeah, this this is this is higher than it. Um, uh, and um, and the fully causal one would be close to oops. one. Um, the fully causal ones are close to one. And and that is a important criteria. Um, so now I've gotten myself all bungled up. Um, uh, so the yeah. between indirect causality and correlation or non causal, that would be the real sticking point. Yeah, I mean, the indirect causation here is often normally kind of weak, too. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, we live in an imperfect world and noise is gonna be really confusing for a lot of purposes. So I don't view this as kind of disqualifying. Sorry, this is, um, I don't view it as disqualifying, but you know, it, it, all techniques have limits and this is a limit, but I don't know of any other game in town that reliably allows us to reasonably probe whether whether something is is causal or not from observational data. In fact, there are some people who view it as heresy. But okay. but in, 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 in terms of the classification, do you think that there's a way of comparing distribution to which you points rather than uh, a function like the, the yeah. rather than the image? Yeah. Yeah, we've talked about that. And in fact, Xiao Yan, um, Xiao Yan, there's actually a similar issue which Xiao Yan and I need to work on which is involves, um, uh, she has a classifier for outbreak or non-outbreak, where we think actually a deep learning model could be, I think a deep learning model could be quite useful for that or uh, some other machine learning model to predict based on the underlying particle values. Um, and similarly here, I think based on the underlying particle values, you could probably have a more effective machine learning tool. Um, than just looking at the images. Yeah. It's, um, it needs some, some serious work, but doing the images was something we could easily do with what's called um, uh, convolutional neural networks, and we did, and we're, we got quite good results. So, you know, it's a first step, um, but yes, I agree with you. The underlying particle values would probably be more, or sorry, part of the underlying, the underlying actual row ensembles would probably be more helpful than that. Because you can look at, like, I guess, like how causally linked will have some sort of idea Correct. of degree of causality. Correct. Ex it, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. For anyone who's really interested in going into this more, I have a lot of, I have a lot of comments on learning from this, like, the effects of noise on things and and so on. Not all of them are as beautiful as that, but um, it it gives some sort of practical guidance on this. This looks a little bit old, so I, I, I'm afraid this is an old one. I, I, I may have released to you the wrong wrong one. Um, yeah. So I agree that uh, there's some real uh, real opportunities there. Okay. Um, time, ladies and gentlemen stops for no one. Um, and uh, it's uh, it approaching half past five on a Friday. And uh, I'm sure that